So E3 was a lot of fun and Nintendo had some really cool announcements and yada, 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 but it seemed smaller and emptier than previous years. Some companies just weren't even there. That's not to say it was empty, don't get me wrong. It, it was just like comparatively, you know? Anyway, the one thing that I did notice when I finally got to walk around was the abundance of new retro hardware. Companies trying to monetize nostalgia. This year more than ever, there were a ton of products whose goal was to give us a better experience playing retro games in the modern era. And you know I'm all about that. From new age 1080p arcade cabinets to new 1080p home consoles to devices that upscale your old hardware to 1080p. And then there's this guy. Cool. I do have all you guys. <laughs> Hyperkin makes a lot of retro hardware. You might know them from the Retron 5. That's a console that plays Sega Genesis, Super Nintendo, NES, most 16-bit and under games. It's a very convenient way to get your retro games on a modern TV. It gets a lot of flack because it uses software emulation as opposed to hardware emulation like the analog consoles do. This means that there might be some compatibility issues with some games. Not a lot of games, but enough where I have to note. The upside is that it's way cheaper than an analog console. It's also probably a lot cheaper than getting an actual Super Nintendo or Sega Genesis to output 720p. At E3, Hyperkin unveiled their newest console, which is the Ultra Retron, which to my knowledge is the first ever commercially available N64 with an HDMI output. Well, does it even work right now? Is this just uh, like a... So it does work. <laughs> <Okay>. um, <laughs> uh, Before I get into like asking. It does work, yeah. We um, actually, one of our developers, Andrew, he uh, did a video like of showing it off before E3. What is in that video? It is a prototype. Things are subject to change, whatever we do. You know what I mean? We're just, we're not giving any like final of what we're doing yet until we hear from the community and see what you guys want. Right. Right now it uses software emulation like the older Retrons, but it's still a prototype, so they're ready to listen to fans and see what people want. Uh, but one thing that we do want to make sure of it is that we have, like, you know, one of the highest compatibilities that we can. We want to make sure we can do NTS US, NTSC Japan, as well as PAL cartridges. Uh, four player local co op, we want to make sure that 4 3 16 9 aspect ratio, and um, yeah, uh, 720p. We're trying to make it the best that it can be. And like, you know, the public has very high expectations yeah. on this thing. So we're not gonna release something until we personally feel that it's ready. Mm -hmm. right. So okay. stay tuned and yeah. I'll give you guys more updates once okay. we have them. Yes, cool. I'm, I'm very interested in that. I'm willing to bet that they're going to stick with the more cost-effective software emulation, which isn't the end of the world. The controller is actually the most exciting part for me. It's called the Admiral. Not only is it a more ergonomic design than the original N64 controller, which is a dumpster fire, but it has a memory card slot on the dongle. And that memory card slot also has a micro SD card slot next to it. So the adapter, what you can do is you can plug in your either OEM or third party memory card. Then you put in an SD card and you switch it from controller mode to transfer mode. Basically what you do is you press the transfer button right here and it transfers the save file on your memory card onto your SD card. Oh, wow. And then you can take the SD card, put it in your computer, ta-da, you have the save backed up. You can also Whoa. do the same thing where you transfer it <laughs> from your uh, SD card to your computer to the SD card to the memory card. So let's say that, you know, you're playing a certain game like Gotland Legends on your computer. Um, and then you're like, oh, hey, I want to play it on my Nintendo 64. You can do that too. So wait, oh, Isn't it I'm, I'm getting my mind blown by the whole transferring save situation. Isn't it awesome? So Pokemon Stadium has the thing where you can put the Game Boy cartridge in. Yeah, yeah uh, That is one thing that we, okay. it's not compatible. It turns back is not. Yeah. Uh, but what is what we're telling you to not do it. I wrote the manual, so it yeah. says it in there. Please All do right. not do this. Do not plug in four admirals and plug in rumble packs and see what happens. Okay. Oh, do not oh do God. that. That was going to be my next <laughs> question. Gonna like... We call it the quake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but technically this does support rumble pack? Rumble pack, yes. Oh, wow. Please do not rumble your Right, yeah, I know. I'm trying to think of what saves could be very useful to have on the computer. Um, Gauntlet oh, no. Legends, Quest 64. Are, are there, uh, are, is it limited to the amount of saves that you can transfer, or is it any N64 can, game save transfer? It is ones that you can save onto a memory pack. Okay, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, but the thing is though, is why I find this so important, is that uh, memory cards use a coin battery. 
if you open yes, it up, that's yeah. in there. Those memory coins are dying. Yeah. Uh, I have Quest 64 save data that I've been working <laughs> on like half my life for. Uh, right. So yeah, that's backed up right now. I'm also really excited about their cables, which I know is a really stupid sentence to hear, but hear me out. These cables are for convenience. They're so you can connect any console to the HDMI port on your TV, which is important to have these days. They're not gonna upscale your console. It's still going to output the console's native resolution, but this is extremely useful in a lot of cases, like, for example, the Dreamcast. Our cables have a 4 3 aspect ratio switch. You can play it in the right aspect or the, the other one. <laughs> so what, did they already, who makes the one for the Dreamcast? So there's that a company called about. Pounds that makes similar things, but they'll, like, I don't know about the Dreamcast, but I know their SNES and their PlayStation 1 forces it to uh, 69 and 720p. So, so if you want to do Dreamcast in 1080p right now, what do you got to do? This to, like, uh, OSSC or a Frame Meister or something like and that. And that's the only way to yeah. do that. Yeah, okay. Because so, I think so this, so this is actually a good... We, yeah, we no, should get this. Yeah, probably. <laughs> that's what you say. Hyperkin also showed off their Duke controller for Xbox One and Windows PC, which is already available. They just have new colors for it. And their brand new Hyper Blaster HD. OEM light guns only work on CRT TVs. That means you can't play games like Duck Hunt on modern TVs. Hyperkin has a unique solution to this problem. Oh, so this is only good with the, uh, your, your console? Uh, it's not only with our console, it's only with the cartridge. Oh, so it is compatible. Okay. Uh, so it is compatible cool. with other HD consoles. Um, it is compatible with top loader um, NESs. Um, so it's just it's just not uh, you want to make sure it's top loader, not front loader. Right. Right now, this only works for duck kind because we're licensing out software okay. for it. So if, there were, if this becomes popular, then there might be more in the future. And just, you know, we're trying it out, seeing if we get to the public and all that. So. This won't work for the other game with the Hogan's game. Alley. No, uh, no, no, the other one in the cartridge. Skeet shooting. Skeet shooting, yeah. Skeet shooting, yeah, it's only that. Okay, okay. I'm interested in how that works. Like, why why this needs to be, like, what is this doing to the cartridge to make it work with that? I mean, I have never played Duck Hunt on a, on a modern TV. Yeah. But it, does, it looks like it, it's flashing a lot harder than it normally yeah. does, doesn't it? Doesn't yeah. Like, like, when I shoot, what are the cameras doing? <laughs> when he shoots, the whole screen turns black, but the duck goes white, so that the, the camera in here can, yeah. can pick up the white block. Oh. Yeah, so if you fire this at a light bulb, it should yeah. theoretically trick it. And that, that's why it doesn't work, that's why it works on CRTs and it doesn't work on LCDs. But this thing makes it work on yeah. LCDs. But that's enough about Hyperkin. Do you remember when you were younger going to an arcade and saying to yourself, when I get older, I'm gonna buy one of these arcade cabinets for your house. And now you're older, and you know that that would be a financially irresponsible decision. Plus, where the hell are you gonna put the damn thing? Well, Arcade 1UP has made it a slightly less financially irresponsible decision. They make affordable cabinets with beautiful high-definition LCD screens. Most of them pack three or four games into one cabinet, and the units themselves are slightly smaller than regular arcade cabinets. They even have miniature versions too. This one's Marvel yeah, Super. Marvel Shut up. <laughs> this one's Marvel. This one's Marvel Superheroes, uh, X Men: Children of the Atom, and The Punisher. See these? Yeah, they have Turtles in Time over there. Oh. Yeah. Well, it's both of them. Both of what? Original arcade game and Turtles in Time. Oh. Wow, that looks amazing. I know. Actually, it looks, it looks square. It looks completely square. It might be. I mean, it might be the original aspect. I think it's a 4 by 3 monitor that just cropped it. Maybe. How much are these? So, most of the stuff that we have in the booth is under $500. Okay, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, so uh, cabinets like the Marvel Superheroes are going to be retailing for $299. Uh, Turtles is going to be retailing for $349. Star Wars, we haven't set a price on yet. The cocktail table is $499. And it's all going to be making its way out to major retailers this fall. I'm sorry, what's the difference between the little ones and the big ones? So there's a actually price not a difference. So they're actually the same cabinet. They're all four feet tall. This oh. portion right here is a visor that you get either with it or separately. That's cool. Yeah. Now how much are the little ones? Uh, they're going to be 199 Sorry, they are 199 They're okay. making their way out to retailers now. Awesome. Now, this is all sick. Yeah. Now, are the, the screens that you got in there are awesome. Yeah. 
they are unique screens. Everything that's inside really? of us is proprietary stuff. So they're like unique square screens that you guys have? You know what, I'm not 100% sure about the actual technicality yeah. of it. You can buy an original Marvel Super Heroes cabinet for about a thousand bucks. You can also buy an original Turtles in Time cabinet for about 3,000 bucks if you're lucky. Or you can buy the Arcade 1UP version, which has more games in it for $300 or $350 respectively. Well, yeah, that's actually where it came from, is that um, basically there are three major issues of why people don't bring an arcade cabinet into their house. One is the cost, two is the weight, and three is the actual size. Yeah. So we shrunk them down, made them lighter, and they're at a great price point, right? Yeah. This E3, I'm noticing a lot more of like uh, companies that are focusing on retro hardware. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a, a awesome space to be in. Yeah. Um, I guess it's because we're the kids who grew up with this stuff, and now we have money, so we're so and that's exactly <laughs> dumping it, it back right? into it. It's, it's, it. That's exactly what it is. And we all kind of wanted that machine to be in our house, and we didn't have to pay for it, right? Because we went yeah. and we would drop our entire allowance into an arcade cabinet, right? Right. So, are you ever going to buy one of these for your house? No. Where would I put it? I'm really thinking about it, too. I would totally get turtles and, uh, the Turtles one, but I don't know where I would put it. On the same front is my arcade, which has even cheaper and even smaller arcade cabinets. But that's not the most exciting thing that they had. The most exciting thing that they had was this monstrosity. It's called the Retro Champ. It plays NES and Famicom games. You might ask yourself, why the f would I want to play NES games portably if I had to lug this thing around? Well, they actually gave me a pretty solid answer. Yeah, the concept behind it is that if you're going to a retro shop or a swap meet or, you know, a yard sale, a lot of times you'll run into cartridges, you don't know if they work, you want to buy them. This gives you something portable to take yeah. with you on the road. You can test your cartridges right there. There's little um, details on the device that are really interesting, like a cleaning kit. Yeah, look on the bottom. Oh, yeah, yeah, right here, right? Yeah, so there's a little button that releases it. So, yeah, so that thing slides right off. There you oh, go. that unit probably doesn't have the bottle in there, yeah. but you get a little bottle that you can put the solution into, and also some um, Q-tips. So this was made, it sounds like this was made specifically so that you can try out games before you buy them. It's one of the reasons for the portable aspect of it. Because like enthusiast. when it first, when people were first writing articles about it and stuff, mm -hmm. it, it looks ridiculous because it's so yeah, big. Sure. Uh, but that makes a lot of sense. One of the influences was the, uh, I'm a record collector, so one of the, back in the day you would be able to get these little portable record players. Oh, yeah, so yeah, if you yeah. go into a store, you'd be able to listen to the records. So I wanted something similar to that uh, for gaming. My only gripe is that the screen is blurry. It looks like an HD screen that is displaying a 240p signal with no upscaling. So what was uh, what was your decision to go with the 16 by 9 screen? Was that just the cost? Yes, it, it's, it's what's available with, with our solution too. So it's the screen as well. We wanted to get a screen that's large enough that, that's gonna be uh, an affordable price. The HDMI isn't gonna yield any better results either. Luckily, it'll retail at 80 bucks. Whatever shortcomings it has, it's probably just to keep the price low. They also have their own miniature arcade cabinets for very cheap, just $35 and handheld versions with multiple games on them. As far as retro home consoles go, Polymega might be the most exciting. It's another software emulated console. Polymega has been catching some flack from the retro gaming community for reasons that I'm not quite sure about. I think they've gone back on some promises of hardware emulation or some sort of hybrid hardware and software emulation. I know that they got busted trying to pretend that arcade footage was actually Sega Saturn footage running on their hardware. That's a big yikes. But regardless of all that, what they have now is actually pretty solid. Each retro console is a different module that you slide onto the top. There's actually noticeable latency when using the USB controller port on the base unit but there's seemingly no latency when using the controller port on the module itself. But well, this is the SNES module, and below it is the disk drive, right here. Oh, okay. Right. Like you take the top off and you put a Genesis module on. Right, right, no, I see the other modules over there. We have four modules, yeah. We have uh, the classic 8-bit NES module, 
and we have a Super Nintendo module, a Mega Drive Genesis and 32X module, and then a TurboGrafx-16 PC and the Super Graphics module. Do you have pricing ready for all this stuff? Yeah, it's on pre-order right now on our website, polymega.com. Okay. Uh, $299 for the base unit, it plays Sega Saturn, PlayStation 1, TurboGrafx CD, Sega CD, and Neo Geo CD. And that just it doesn't have a module at all on it? Uh, it has a, a dust rubber, which is like, okay. it looks like a module, but there's no hardware inside of it. All right. Um, and then uh, the modules are available separately for $59.99 each, and okay. that includes the module with the cartridge and controller ports. What about for uh, something like the Sega Genesis? Uh, is that also 4x3? Uh, yeah, four, well, it, you can choose whatever. Is there like a pixel perfect one? There's a pixel perfect one. Oh, wow. Version. Okay. So in terms of emulating these, is every module uh, its own emulator? Um, it is uh, a little bit different. It depends on, we have, we have uh, emulators that cover all the modules, obviously. Okay. Yeah, for NES, the classic 8-bit, uh, we have a licensed copy of Mesa. Okay. Uh, Genesis and Mega Drive, we have a, uh, the world's first 64-bit version of Mega Fusion, okay. uh, which was made specifically for Polymega. And then uh, for Sega Saturn, Super Nintendo, PC Engine, and PlayStation 1, uh, we have a license of uh, benefit. This is a really nice high-end retro console and the games look stunning on it. But again, don't expect analog quality coming out of here. Expect a slightly better experience than a Retron. So that comes with the base unit and then with the, with the modules, you also get another controller? That's right, yeah. The modules all come with their own custom controller. Oh, so you can have, you're always going to have a second player. That's cool. So, let's say you have the Super Nintendo module yeah, in. Can you still play your Sega Genesis games that are saved to the system, or do you need to swap out? Like, can I just click on Shinobi and play it right now? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Absolutely. So once you add it to the favorites, you don't have to use your cartridge again? Uh, you can add it to your collection. So, oh. uh, here, do, do this. Um, go to Add to Collection and Install. Okay. Press the B button. So it says, you know, it requires 2.63 megabytes. Yeah. Uh, and then you need it, yes. And it'll ask you what storage device you want to put it on. And there you go, it's, it's in. Oh, wow. It's really nice that you can rip your ROMs to the device's memory for storage. I'm interested if you can then take these ROMs or even your save files and load them up onto your PC. If that's not an option now, I'm sure that once it gets released, the homebrew or hacking community will figure out a way to get that stuff onto your PC easily. Although it's not an open source piece of hardware and they have a reason for that. How is it um, with like open source, open source software and like homebrewing? Like, is it compatible with like, you can like go in and mess around with it or is it pretty no, much No, it's locked? a closed source box, yeah. Okay. The reason for that is because uh, we have uh, an intention to launch a digital platform for, okay. uh, you know, a lot, there's a lot of indie game developers yeah. out there, they don't have a good channel to release their stuff without it getting immediately pirated. Right. So it's a good way for them to get their stuff out there and, uh, and you know, hopefully get people to start making more new yeah. games, right? So since this is all um, software emulation based, has, have you run into any like compatibility issues with any like games? Officially so released games? No, not really. I mean, okay. there's there's going to be like your one or two that uh, yeah. on PlayStation games that have behavioral issues. The thing about uh, about this system is we had to develop new BIOSes for a lot of the CD right. systems, so uh, that came with it a little bit of uh, additional testing that needed to be happening, okay. and, uh, and we've been working really hard. The Sega Saturn uh, emulation of our system is really highly compatible, though. Okay. So I think we're at about 99% compatibility. Oh wow! And we have a custom BIOS. Yeah. Version. And uh, Saturn hasn't really been done before. By yeah, I remember time. when you guys like launched this, like that was like the big surprise was that you had Saturn in relation. Yeah, to everyone that. really was asking us for yeah. it. So we were here at E3 last year, they were like, when are you going to have Saturn support? When are you going to have Saturn yeah. support? And so we're back here now and we have full Saturn support. That's cool. And they also have their own light gun. It's the year of the light guns. You plug it in over USB, there's a little uh, white square that's around the frame of the yeah. game. And um, and then based on where that the position of the of the cap of the gun is yeah. in relation to that square, it determines your, your, oh, wow. your angle. And so you don't need any sensors or anything like that yeah. on your TV when you're playing, and you can use a light gun That's and, cool. and do everything. There. So Hyperkin has uh, their own light gun that they just made, and they have to have uh, that like a like, like a pass through adapter. adapter. Yeah, on on the cartridge, and it only works for Duck Hunt. <laughs> Yeah, right now it only works with Duck Hunt. Ours, ours won't be anything like that. So how does that get around that? Our, our, our system doesn't need it because uh, it's 
it, we have enough power to, to calculate in real time. We have a real computer CPU inside of this, so we have enough power to calculate in real time dynamics like the location and position of, yeah. of a camera in relation to uh, an object that's on screen, process right. that in frame time, and update the emulator. I mean, Polymega is a little pricier than other options that are out yeah. there, but you're getting a higher quality experience and you're yeah. getting that, that thing that you want in your living room. Right. And, uh, you know, we think for the for the right person, if you have, you know, if you're in your 30s, we're all in our 30s or 40s yeah. now, and we all grew up playing these games. Yeah. Like, as long as you have a legitimate job and you aren't barely scraping by yeah. somehow, you can probably afford to get a nice retro game console for you yeah. if you care about retro games. Yeah. All right, I'm running out of time in this video, but I had to tell you about this guy. Hey, go Marseille! Woohoo! Right, I'll do one more. Go. I'm done. <laughs> Nintendo actually told me about them. This company makes a device called the M Classic. It's a little HDMI dongle that uses some sort of magic algorithm to determine what needs to be sharpened and what is purposely blurred for the background of the image. It scales your image by a certain ratio, so it sounds like it makes 480p footage 720p, it makes 720p footage 1080p, and it makes 1080p footage 4K. And if you really wanted to, you can stack these cables together to make 480p footage 4K if you wanted to. You'd have to put three or four cables next to each other. I'm not doing the math. There's also supposedly very little lag. As you can see, the CEO is very excited about it. Hey, look at this, it's crazy. It was originally created for full motion video, you know, movies. But obviously, it's a really good tool for gaming. I take the cheapest player on earth. Sorry, Toshima. I got my light mass. I like it, right? <laughs> Yeah. We take a damn HDDSP, right? On the best TV, before, after. Enjoy. It's like almost exactly the same. That's scary. Yeah. And yeah. you know, I tell you, most people, unfortunately, they like this better. I yeah. panic. It raises some really weird questions for me. Like, for example, I should just plug my Nintendo Switch into the M Classic and use it all the time, right? But then, if I capture footage using this M Classic, then my footage is gonna look better than yours would if you purchased the same game. Also, if I wanted to play my Sega Dreamcast with the most authentic and highest resolution possible, would running my footage through one of these types of upscalers really be an authentic experience? This is a different type of upscaling than something like an OSSC. The M Classic is taking your polygons and sharpening them, making them nice and smooth, whereas an OSSC is line doubling. It's just making the pixels bigger. I'll definitely have to check out the M Classic when it comes out and do some tests on it. They did give me an M cable, which is very nice and very similar, but it's not the new hotness. I gotta check out the new hotness. All of this stuff we checked out within the last few hours on the final day of E3. And honestly, it was the most exciting part for me. It's really cool to be able to see these companies so passionate about retro gaming and wanting to give us the best retro gaming experience without being slapped with a cease and desist by the big red tyrant. The Polymega and the Ultra Retron might have one E3 for me. And I can say that because <laughs> Mario Maker wasn't there. But anyway, what do you guys think about all this new age retro stuff that we got to see at E3 this year? What was your favorite thing that you saw at E3? Whether it be an actual game announcement or a piece of hardware that you saw in this video, leave it in the comments below. Add me on Twitter, any and all of this other social media garbage. As always, we got new videos and live streams all the time. Our schedule is kind of back to normal now that we're back from E3, but there's some other stuff going on. So check out the pinned tweet over on our Twitter. We got Wolfden live right here on YouTube every single Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And also go to twitch.tv slash Wolfden. I'm probably live right now playing Mario Maker or something. And of course, you can support us here on YouTube or over on Twitch using Twitch Prime, which is free. If you have Amazon Prime, help us out. But the easiest and most important thing that you can do is just subscribe, that's it, and share this video with a friend, a friend who you like to play all these retro games with. You need a buddy. The Polymega comes with another controller with each module. The Ultra Retron has four, up to four players. Anyway, thank you guys very much. You have yourself a very good week. I love you so much.